The first aspect of hydronic pumping is pump mechanics or how a centrifugal pump works. This task will concentrate on pump mechanics and the pump curves. So what is a pump? This picture shows some of the types of centrifugal pumps. While this group does not include all centrifugal pump types, it will give a basic understanding of a variety of centrifugal pumps and their similarities. A pump is a machine which adds energy to the fluid for the purpose of increasing pressure or moving it along a pipeline. A pump, in fact, doesn't create anything. It doesn't make water. It doesn't make pressure. It creates differential pressure. Now, there are two basic types of pumps. Positive displacement pumps, which add energy directly to a movable boundary, imparts energy to the fluid. Positive displacement pumps are also known as PD pumps. Some of the examples of PD pumps are screw pumps, piston pumps, or gear pumps. A second type of pumps are rotodynamic pumps, which are commonly known as centrifugal pumps or CPs. They add energy indirectly by a rotating part in the form of velocity, and then converting the velocity to pressure. Centrifugal pumps are the workhorse device in HVAC systems. We'll concentrate on the workings of this device for this training module. Centrifugal pumps come in an infinite variety of shapes and sizes to meet very specific application needs in the HVAC market. A significant difference between these pumps is the shape and the function of the pump casing or the volute. The volute provides a pressure boundary for the pump and provides a proper path from the suction inlet to the discharge outlet. Typical types of pumps for HVAC applications are vertical multi-stage for domestic pressure boosters, wet rotor pumps for coil pumps or circulator loops, and suction pumps for primary, secondary, tertiary, and condenser water loops, submersible well pumps for groundwater and water source heat pumps, double suction for primary and condenser water loops, variable speed wet rotor pumps for boiler, secondary, tertiary loops, coil and coil pumps, and vertical inlines for primary, secondary, tertiary, and condenser water loops. Detailed specific application guidelines and feature benefits of these pumps are discussed in subsequent modules. The first major component we talked about was the volute. The second major pump component is the impeller. These are three common types of impellers associated with centrifugal pumps open, semi-open, and closed. Open and semi-open types are most often used when solids are present in the liquid. Let's hope that the closed loop HVAC systems that we'll be designing will not have this attribute. An open type impeller is more expensive to manufacture too. In most HVAC applications, high efficiency and the ability to trim are desirable attributes. So we'll select pumps which utilize closed impeller design. Now the design of the impeller is very important. The width of the cross-sectional area of the vanes is the major determining factor of the amount of flow that's produced by the impeller. The diameter of the impeller is a major determining factor of the amount of head or pressure that can be produced by the impeller. And the vane shape is the major influence on the impeller's performance or efficiency. Over the years, pump designers have tabulated volumes of data of performance based on these and other design components. This information is often associated with a term called specific speed. Now the term specific speed is often misunderstood. When we hear the term, we naturally think of impeller rotational speed or velocity. In reality, it is a number used to categorize the performance of impeller designs based on design experience. It is a dimensionless value. This chart shows the relationship of specific speed with impeller types. Specific speed is defined as the speed at which a given impeller would operate if reduced proportionally in size, so as to deliver a flow of one gallon per minute at one foot of head. An impeller generating a very large volume of water but at a very low head has a high specific speed. Another impeller generating very low flow but at a very high head has a low specific speed. The lower values, 500 to 1500, pertain to the geometry associated with radial vane type impellers. The middle values, 1500 to 7000, are typical for Francis vane and mixed flow type impellers. Higher values, 7000 to 1500, are typical for axial flow type impellers. Note that as we progress from left to right, the impeller inlet I approaches the size of the outlet for the impeller. Just in case you wanted to know, here's the equation for specific speed, where NS is the specific speed, N is the pump rotational speed in RPMs, Q is the flow in gallons per minute, and H is the feed in head. Now it's very important also that the impeller turn in the right direction. The vanes need to slap the water rather than cup it. As the impellers rotate, they hurl the water outward up and out of the pump. This creates a natural vacuum at the eye of the impeller, which allows in more water. Incorrect direction of rotation in most often cases happens using three-phase motors when they're wired improperly. To solve this problem, when it occurs, you only need to switch any two of the electrical leads. 
Now the results of incorrect or backward rotation are an inability for the pump to reach the desired head or pressure, an inability of the pump to reach the desired flow, and also excessive noise in the pump because the veins are cutting the water instead of flinging it off of the impeller. Now this picture explains the operation of the centrifugal pump, and it shows the volute and the impeller working together. The fluid enters through the inlet of the volute through the suction eye of the impeller, where the impeller adds energy in the form of velocity through centrifugal force. When the fluid leaves the impeller, there's a decrease in velocity. Velocity and pressure are inversely proportional. As velocity increases, pressure decreases. And as velocity decreases, pressure increases. The decrease in velocity here results in an increase in pressure as the fluid then leaves the pump. Now for a few quick notes on some of the other components of a centrifugal pump. The first is the pump shaft. Now the pump shaft must stay aligned within two to three thousandths of an inch with the motor shaft to prevent any excessive wear or pump failure. The next is the coupling which connects the motor shaft to the pump shaft. Then there's the bearings which help keep the pump and the motor shafts aligned. Ball bearings in the motor and then sleeve bearings in the pump. And then the fluid in the pumps help to lubricate the pump bearings. Next is the mechanical seal. And that's a ring around the shaft that's rotating with an extremely close fit with a mirror finish. And then the surface tension and the fluid pressure helps create the seal. The next is the nameplate. Now the nameplate is needed to verify any information on the pump that's in the application. This data is always needed when contacting the factory for any service or replacement. There's two main types of inline pump units. The first type that we'll discuss here is the three-piece or the dry running pump. The three-piece pump refers to the three basic components of this type of a pump. The pump casing with the impeller, the bearing frame, and the motor. Now dry running does not refer to the pumps that run without liquid. In this case, dry runner means that the liquid pump does not contact the motor. It's sealed with a mechanical shaft seal inside the casing. Three-piece pumps have interchangeable motors, which provides application flexibility, offering a wide range of flow and head combinations with one pump body. Three-piece pumps are also repairable. Should any of the components fail, the individual components are replaceable. Now, proper shaft alignment is necessary for long life, and the bearings usually require annual service. Three-piece pumps are typically more expensive than one-piece pump types. Now the second type of inline pump unit is the wet running pump. Wet running pumps are often referred to as wet rotor pumps. The liquid in the pump lubricates the motor, provides the cooling, and is a noise reducing jacket. Now the wet rotor pump still consists of the major components of the pump casing, the impeller, bearings, and the motor. The main difference with the wet rotor pump is that the motor bearings are lubricated by the fluid that's in the pump. So we couldn't pump any type of a fluid that was too thick, viscous, or syrupy that wouldn't provide proper lubrication to the bearings. Now there's no mechanical shaft seal to these types of pumps. And because there is no seal, there's no regular maintenance that required for these types of pumps. Since the wet rotor pump is a one-piece pump, repair is not practical. Also, motor is dedicated and designed for a particular casing. Therefore, a motor exchange is not possible. One-piece pumps are usually less expensive than three-piece pumps. If a failure occurs, the pump is usually replaced rather than repaired. One-piece pumps are now also available with integrated variable speed drives and sensors. These pumps are very application flexible and cost effective when considering operation costs. A key to understanding pump operation is the understanding of pump curves. The pump curves are a map of a pump's performance. They provide much of the needed information about its operating characteristics. Pump curves can be constructed in many formats, but all contain certain amounts of data. The first curve that we'll discuss is the pump performance curve, which is also known as the head capacity curve, referring to the primary axis. The vertical axis is the pressure measured in feet of water, or PSI, and the horizontal axis is flow measured in gallons per minute. The amount of flow that a pump can produce is dependent on the head present in the system. The pump listed here can produce anywhere from zero gallons per minute to just over 150 gallons per minute depending on the system where it's installed. For instance, if this pump were put in a system with 343 feet of head, the pump would produce zero gallons per minute. This point is also known as shutoff head or deadheading the pump because the pump will produce no flow at full speed. If this pump were put in a system with approximately 290 feet of head, the pump would produce 100 gallons per minute. The same pump, if it were put in a system with approximately 170 feet of head, would produce its maximum flow of just over 150 gallons per minute. This point is known as runout. There is a risk of cavitation when operating pumps at this point. Additional curves depicted are the pump efficiency, which is measured as a percentage depicted here on the right, 
the brake horsepower listed here on the left, which is used to select the size of the motor, the net positive suction head required by the pump in feet listed here on the right, and all of these curves are dependent on where the pump is currently operating. Most HVAC pumps operate at an anomalous speed of 1,750 RPMs, which is the speed of a four-pole motor. If higher pressures are required, a two-pole or nominal 3,450 RPMs may be desirable. Occasionally, six or eight-pole motors may be used when high flow and low head is desirable. All of these factors are critical to the pump system designer. A variation of the pump curve is shown here. All of the information shown in the previous format is also available here. The head, the flow, the horsepower, the efficiency, and the NPSHR required by the pump. Now many pumps have trimmable impellers. This means that the impeller diameter can be cut to match the performance determined by the system designer. In this example, five impeller trims are shown from the largest that can fit in a specific pump casing to the smallest that is recommended for this pump casing by the manufacturer. We'll discuss the performance impact of impeller diameter change later in this course, but for now we'll just observe the curve relationships. As a note, impellers are usually shown in even increments, which is based on the maximum and minimum recommended impeller diameters. The actual selected diameters available are in 1 8 inch increments and are cut to an accuracy of about 1 64th of an inch. The impeller is always cut to the next largest 1 8 inch increment. After the system designer has determined the head requirement at design flow, a suitable pump is then selected that will meet that criteria. For this example, we'll use a desired flow of 1,000 gallons per minute at 103 feet of head. And we'll show this as a triangle located at the intersection of the design flow and the design head. The actual impeller shipped with this pump will be a 10.5 inch impeller. If the design point would have been 1,000 gallons per minute at 97 feet of head, then a 9 and 7 8 inch impeller would be supplied with the pump. At our design point of 1,000 gallons per minute at 103 feet of head, we can now look at the other performance factors of this pump. At this operating point, the efficiency would be 85.2%. The brake horsepower required by the pump would be 30.1 brake horsepower. And the net positive suction head required for the pump would be 9.5 feet. Now at the design of 30.1 brake horsepower, a 30 horsepower motor could actually meet that requirement because it's within the motor safety factor. But we have to remember that it's possible for the pump to operate beyond this design point based on the actual system and resistance. Therefore, we must select a motor that can operate anywhere on the pump impeller curve. In this case, the pump can easily surpass the 30 horsepower capability of the motor, so 40 horsepower NOL motor would be selected. NOL meaning not overloading. Most centrifugal pumps are not rated in PSI or in pressure. Pumps are rated by the feet of head of the liquid being pumped. This is also known as total dynamic head, or TDH for short. Now, total dynamic head is the total equivalent height that a fluid is to be pumped, taking into account the friction losses through the pipe. Total dynamic head is determined by adding together the three factors. Elevation, which is rated in feet. Pressure, which is normally rated in PSI, which is then converted to feet. And the friction loss in the pipe, also usually rated in feet. To calculate the elevation head in the system, is the height differential between the current elevation of the fluid to the final elevation that the fluid is to be pumped. And it is calculated from the surface to surface. In the example shown here, the surface of the suction tank to the upper surface of the discharge tank, the difference is 200 feet. Therefore, the elevation in this system is 200 feet. The second component of calculating total dynamic head is pressure. Now, since centrifugal pumps are not rated in pressure or in PSI, but rated in feet of head, we need to be able to convert from PSI to feet of head. In the example shown here, we have a tube that is 1 inch by 1 inch, which is 1 square inch. In order to read 1 PSI at the bottom of this tube, we'd have to fill the column full of water to the elevation of 2.31 feet tall. Therefore, the conversion of PSI the feet of head for water between 32 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 1 PSI equals 2.31 feet of head. The formula for the conversion of PSI to feet of head is PSI times 2.31 divided by the specific gravity of the fluid would give you the feet of head of the fluid. And then the formula for converting from head to PSI, the head of the fluid, times the specific gravity of the fluid divided by 2.31 would convert from head to PSI. Now the specific gravity of water is 1.0. So if we want to calculate PSI to feet of water, we must take into consideration the weight of the liquid, so in this case water. 
So how do we come up with a figure of 2.31 feet of head equals 1 psi for water? Well, the 2.31 is derived from the specific weight of water because we calculate pressure by pounds per square inch. Well, there's 144 square inches in one square foot. Well, the weight of water between 32 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit is roughly 62.4 pounds per cubic foot of water. We go from the units of pounds per square inch to feet by multiplying by the 144 square inches divided by the square foot. Next, we multiply that times the specific weight of water, which is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, which would give us 2.31. So now to practice this, if we had a column of water 100 feet tall, what would a pressure gauge at the bottom of the column of water read in PSI? Well, that would be 100 divided by 2.31, which would equal 43.29 PSI. If we had a column of water that's 80 feet tall, what would the pressure gauge at the bottom of that column read in PSI? Well, that would be 80 divided by 2.31, which would give us 34.6 PSI. Now, if we had a column of water that was 23 feet tall, what would the pressure gauge at the bottom of that column read in PSI? That would be 23 divided by 2.31, which would give us roughly 10 PSI. Or to be specific, that would be 9.95670995 PSI. Now that we've calculated PSI for water, the last thing we want to look at is what effect does the specific gravity of a fluid have on pressure and head? Well, if we had a column of gasoline with a specific gravity of 0.7, and that column was 165 feet tall, what would the pressure gauge at the bottom of that column read in PSI? Well, it would be the 165 times the 0.7 specific gravity divided by 2.31 would give us a reading of 50 PSI. If we had a column of salt water with a specific gravity of 1.03 that was also 165 feet tall, what would a pressure gauge at the bottom of that column read in PSI? Well, that would be 165 times 1.03 divided by 2.31 would give us a reading of 74 PSI. Now if we had a column of sugar water with a specific gravity of 1.30 that was also 165 feet tall, what would a pressure gauge at the bottom of that column read in PSI? Would be 165 times the 1.30 specific gravity divided by 2.31 would give us 93 PSI. So what we can see from this is that fluids with a higher or lower specific gravity than water could cause changes in how a pump operates. We hope that this task has helped you better understand pump mechanics and the operations of the pump curves. To learn more about pump operation, continue on to task two, affinity laws, friction head, and the system curves.